Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord, and in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Talking us to us today on the topic our only hope. If you bow your head with me one more moment, Father, once again, God, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. We thank you for the Spirit of God. I thank you, Lord, for the marvelous touch of the Holy Ghost that I felt during the worship service today. I feel strengthened by it. I feel emboldened by it. I feel empowered by it. Master, this word is necessary for all the church. It is especially necessary for the church in America today. I pray, God, that you would anoint your servant as you have never anointed me. Help me, Lord, to speak your words. Help me to deliver your message to your people that they might be edified, but Master, that they might be challenged, and that they might be changed. Send forth your word to heal, to save, to deliver, to restore right now in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Praise God and amen. Revival in the church Today is the only hope for our nation and for our world. You might notice today that the illustration I'm using for my message, you know, is making use of something from modern times I'm, I'm using a scene from the film Star Wars if you remember in the first Star Wars movie oh I know some apostolics are blowing a fuse oh he's using a, a, a movie reference oh my god yes I'll tell you why folks because just because you don't go to the movies don't mean a lot of people haven't at one time or don't now mm -hmm. And if I use a reference from popular culture, then it helps them to grasp hold of what I'm trying to convey. And in the movie, Princess Leia, who is part of the rebellion, part of those who are fighting against a takeover from the evil empire, Princess Leia has planted a message in a little android a little video message that he's able to play if and when he's able to find this character called Obi-Wan Kenobi. And when the droid finally is in the presence of this Obi-Wan Kenobi, all of a sudden he begins to play this message from Princess Leia and her image appears and it's saying, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. 
Boy, I'm going to tell you, it's a terrible thing when you're in such a predicament and you're in such a situation and such a state that there is only one answer to your dilemma. There's only one answer for your trouble. And folks, I'm here to tell you today, America is on a path to complete and utter destruction. It is on a path to destruction, not because gays are allowed to marry. The Bible said where sin doth abound, grace doth even more abound. So if you want to call that sin, fine, call it sin. I don't care what you call it. You can call anything. There were people who called biracial marriage sin. You know, I could care less what you want to label uh, my relationships or my marriage. It don't matter to me. My relationship is with God. My accountability is to God. And your opinion means less to me than what I leave in the toilet when I go to the restroom. I could care less about your opinion. That's not why America's on a path. America's on a path today to utter and complete destruction because the church of Jesus Christ, all of those today who would call themselves Christians, those people, listen to me, who are called by His name, have allowed themselves to become so misled and so distracted that they have completely, utterly, totally lost any concept of their earthly mission. Mm -hmm. They have lost any concept of what God has called us to do. They have lost any concept of what God has called us to be. They have lost any concept as to what God has called us to live. And I'm going to tell you, there is nothing that can destroy faster than God's people being off course. See, there's a lot of foolish, ignorant, stupid. Yeah, I'm saying the words, folks. Because I want you to understand just how serious I am and how serious the Holy Ghost is about this foolishness that goes on in the church world. There are a lot of idiotic, devil-motivated, false prophets in the Christian church world today who get on television. They get in their pulpits and they preach that because of the sin of these or because of the sin of those, we as a nation are going to experience all this trauma and all this hardship and all this difficulty. And I've got news for you today. They are liars, every one of them. They are false prophets. They are not telling the truth that is not what the Word of God teaches. God was willing to spare. Everybody loves to preach about Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, they love to try to suggest that the sins of Sodom were so great that God destroyed these cities. And of course, they misrepresent what the sins of Sodom were to begin with. And they try to lay, put it all on homosexuality, which is pure garbage and misunderstanding of what the Word of God teaches. But I don't have time to go there today. But if they were right, if they were right, got news for you. God was willing to spare Sodom if there were ten righteous in the entire five cities. Mm -hmm. I've always said that I found it interesting that Abraham stopped bargaining with God at ten. I've always said, why in the world didn't Abraham... Hey, God kept coming down. He kept coming down. He kept coming down. Why did Abraham get to 10 and quit? Well, I'm going to tell you my take on it. I'm going to tell you my thoughts about it. We know that Lot had a wife. 
We know that Lot had two daughters, and we know that each of those daughters had a husband, according to the Word of God. That means there were six members of Abraham's family extended. Lot was his nephew in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in that region. Six. Something tells me they weren't all living right. Something tells me they weren't all doing right. What makes me think that? Because Abraham stopped at ten. See, it's all well and good to be able to put the blame on everybody else, but honey, if he went any lower, if he went to five, and God said, I'll spare the city if there's five, but there ain't five, then guess what? He's just indicted his own family. He's just acknowledged that within his own family, somebody ain't doing right. Oh, I'm going to tell you something today. Just because somebody in church don't mean they're doing right. Just because somebody come to church don't mean they're living right. Got news for you, honey. Just because they get in a pulpit and preach don't mean that they're living this thing. That's right. You're foolish if you think that just because a preacher got enough money to be on television that he has some special favor with God and therefore everything he says has more import and more value than what the preacher in the little church in Dallas has to say. Sweetheart, I got news for you. I learned a long time ago, long, long, long time ago, that the ones who have the most exposure, the ones that have the most following, the ones who are hurt the most because they're the loudest and they've got the most uh, cameras on them or what have you, those are the people you need to ignore. Those are the people you need to change the channel. Every time they come on, I change the channel. I don't watch any of them. I don't look at any of them because I know America today is divided like America has never been divided before. I got news for you, honey. Let me fill you in on a little secret. God is not a God of division. God does not promote division. Right. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, God said there are seven things that I hate. And one of the things He said that He hated was someone that went about sowing division. Mm hmm God says, I hate this. The Word of God tells us, Jesus said, a house dividing, uh, divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln quoted that passage when he was speaking of the America, the United States, during the time of the Civil War. He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Satan knows that America is one of the most powerful, prosperous countries in the world. Satan knows that because of America, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been broadcast to more corners of this globe than it ever could have been broadcast if it were not for the fact that the church is sponsoring the missionaries, paying the missionaries, keeping the missionaries on the field are in America. Idiots who call themselves Christians do not understand that Satan has been busy at work trying to sow all kinds of fear in your minds. You believe every idiotic, stupid, mentally deranged conspiracy theory that comes down the path. You believe every one of them. Because Fox News brings people on, and mind you, mind you, I, I just read a book called Hoax. And this man talks about the fact that Fox News is not the same as Fox Broadcasting. He said, even within the Fox organization, from the beginning, it was Rupert Murdoch's dream, his vision, to have a television channel that was uh, devoted to real news, to telling real news, but simply delivering it 
from a conservative perspective. I got news for you. I don't mind that. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't hurt my feelings. I understand that. And if you ever watched Fox News when Shepard Smith was on and, you know, he was their main news guy, uh, they stuck to the facts. And there were many times that he was at odds with some of the Fox Entertainment Fox political commentators. See, some of those other programs you watch, Fox actually makes it known that these programs are for entertainment purposes, and it is opinion, it is not news. But these people on Fox have grown so powerful and they've developed such a large uh, audience in the uh, conservative community, especially the religious right, and they've done so by literally uh, painting pictures of horror, painting pictures of terror, causing people to fear, constant, like, like right now, I, I see things now that just make my mind, boggles my mind. People acting like the country is just in hell because Biden is president. I got news for you. I was a registered Republican from the time I was 18 years old, right up until I was about 30 something. And when Bill Clinton was in office, I hated his guts. Couldn't stand him. He was immoral. He was, you know, not a not a very decent guy. He did a lot of things that uh, bothered me. Now, mind you, I'm, I'm trying to speak from the mindset I was in at that time, okay? So don't anybody start messaging me. Don't. You shouldn't be judging. I don't want to hear that foolishness. I'm talking about how I looked at things back then. I didn't have a very positive image of Bill Clinton, but you know what? By no means did I see our country sliding off in a, into an abyss. By no means did I see our country going to hell in a handbasket simply because a Democrat was in office and he was doing things according to democratic principles and democratic ideas. I, no. I, I, why in the world would I? I? I was too busy looking at what was really going on in the real world. I wasn't listening to conspiracy theories. I wasn't listening to fear mongers. There was a very short time that I used to watch Rush Limbaugh for a while. I kind of got hooked on Rush for a little bit. But after a while, see, I've got a bad habit. I, I have a terrible habit. I have a bad habit of using my own brain. Now, I realize that's something we're not supposed to do. I realize that's something that most Christians today are allergic to. And they just don't understand the concept of using their own brain. But I would listen to Rush, and Rush was always blowing everything so out of proportion and blowing everything up, making it so big. And, and I'd be listening to what he was saying, and then I'd compare it to the reality. I didn't let him create my reality. I compared what he said to reality. And I got to the point where I said, I can't watch this guy anymore. He is so full of malarkey. He is so full of junk. He is so full of garbage. I could tell. I was a conservative. And I knew that, now, what this guy is saying doesn't match up with what's going on. Like right now, we got people acting like the economy is in the worst condition it's ever been in, and oh my God, Biden's just flushing everything down the toilet. Blah, 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 blah. Really? That's funny because all the indicators, according to Mr. Trump, the minute he left office and Biden won election, the stock market was going to crash. That's what I heard him say. But y'all idiots don't think past the end of your nose to realize that everything this man said was crap. It was garbage. It was foolishness. Why in the world can you not wake up and recognize that when he says all this crap and then it happens, he lost the election, he he ended in the White don't give me this, he didn't really lose the election. It don't matter, Biden's in there anyway. The stock market not only didn't crash, but the stock market's doing as well or better than it's ever done. The economy's grown better than it's ever grown. And we're still in a pandemic situation. 
We've got Republican lawmakers and preachers out there screaming and hollering that truckers in America ought to do what the truckers in Canada are doing and blockade cities and block up highways and, and stop, you know, the flow of merchandise and goods from getting around the country and affect our economy, bless God. So, and why? For the sake of the mandates on... Uh, Vaccine mandates, hallelujah, like the like the Canadian truckers are doing. What does the supply line have to do with vaccines? Nothing. If you want to protest vaccines, you dummy, then get you a placard, get you a big old sign, go out in front of a vaccine station somewhere and pick it. Make your voice heard. Doing something that's going to hurt every single person in this country. That is going to cost men and women hours at their job. That is going to cost men and women uh, the ability to work because they wind up being laid off because they don't have what they need to assemble cars in Detroit. Uh, costing uh, businesses millions of dollars in lost sales because they don't have the merchandise they need in order to sell to the public. Causing the public all kinds of distress because things they need they can't get a hold of because the trucker is picketing or excuse me is blockading somewhere instead of delivering his goods do you hear what I'm telling you now that is pure stupidity it is jackassery it is idiotic it is foolish but you know what else it is? It is sowing the seeds of division. Right. Because the Republican Party is doing everything in its power right now. Everything. Everything. Including encouraging people not to get vaccinated. Why are they doing this? Because they believe vaccines could be dangerous? No. Because every one of those lawmakers has had all their vaccines. Sure. Every one of them. Sure have. All these governors, DeSantis, has had all his vaccines. Well, then why are they doing this, Pastor? It's easy, folks, because they want more people to die because they want the numbers to reflect the numbers that Trump experienced so that they can say, see, having Biden for president didn't make any difference. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Why are they calling for truckers to blockade so that the economy can go under and they can say, see, this is Biden's fault. First of all, the vaccine mandates in America, so-called, that exist, exist legally. There have been uh, companies who have mandated. There have been municipalities and local governments which have mandated. Policemen have lost their jobs because they refused to get vaccinated when their municipality required vaccination. Yeah, that's all true. But there is no national mandate. The federal government is not mandating that everybody has to be vaccinated or else. What's the or else coming out of Washington for people that don't get vaccinated? What's the punishment? What's the fine? What's the jail sentence coming out of Washington? For every American who refuses to be vaccinated, there is none. But we have a party in America that American, and I'm telling you this prophetically, folks, if, if, if you don't see it, you are blinded by either stupidity or deception. There is a party in this country that wants power. They are at the bequest of the rich they serve the will of the rich they want power so that they can put you in slavery they literally want to have a two-class system they want to have those that are ruling the ruling class which is going to be the rich and then they want serfs period those who serve the ruling class that is what the GOP has been pushing for now for decades. And let me tell you, it took me a while to see this myself. When I did, I jumped ship and got out of that party and started sounding the warning. And that was how long ago, Tommy? George W. Bush was still in office. 
You need to understand, folks, that America is in deep peril, not because of moral issues, because, listen, God was willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of ten righteous. The truth of the matter is, the righteous can be in the minority in, 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 in the most exaggerated minority, meaning you can have one righteous out of a billion and God will spare the billion for the sake of the righteous. Mm -hmm. That is the word of God. Mm -hmm. The word of God declares that God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. Right. You don't have to worry about God bringing judgment down on America. That is a false message. Yes. It is a lie. It is an untruth. And you have allowed the prophets of doubt and fear mongering to take your eyes off the prize. Mm -hmm. They have distracted you. Satan loves to distract. As long as he can have you looking the wrong way, then honey, you're never seeing the right thing. As long as he can have you doing the wrong thing, then you'll never do the right thing. And I tell the truth. As long as he can have you living a life of fear and panic and dread, then sweetheart, you will never be walking in a life of peace and joy and love and harmony, which is what God has called his people to. Right. We're in deep peril, all right. And just as Princess Leia said to Obi-Wan Kenobi, we only have one hope. We only have one hope for our country. We only have one hope today for our world, and that is we have to get the church back on the right track. There's a word for that. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. There's a word for getting things back on the right track. Hallelujah. When I was a kid, churches used to run about a week or two of meetings where every night the people of God would come to the house of God and they'd hear the word of the Lord preached. And the purpose of those meetings was to help get the people of God on the right track. To help get them away from their distractions. To help get them focused once again on those things which they ought to be focused on. The word for those meetings was revival. Hallelujah. And the church today there is only one hope and that is for revival. We must experience revival and we must experience it now. It tears me up that our country is experiencing so much angst and anger and malice mm -hmm. and division. Listen to me now. And who are the biggest perpetrators of all this wickedness and all this ungodliness? Christians. Mm-hmm. Right-wing, evangelical, fundamentalist Christians. Talk to them and see if within one sentence they don't start peddling their division, if they don't start stirring up the angst, see if they don't start talking like they're angry, talking like they're mad, talking like they know who the enemy is, and the enemy is in Washington. The enemy is the Democrats. The enemy is the liberals. Hello now. Tell me for one second that I'm not right. Because I'll call you a liar. I know I'm right. Got news for you, folks. There is something desperately wrong within the church world when the people who call themselves by the name of the Lord are constantly angry, are constantly fearful, are constantly stirring up angst and division and strife. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Oh, when you got Christians calling for violence, they have lost their way. Man, mm -hmm. have they lost their way. Mm -hmm. Half the people at Trump's January 6th rally, at least half of them, I'm sure, were evangelicals. I'm sure of that. And they were just as ready to jump into the fray, just as ready to get violent and ugly as anybody was because there's that crowd mentality. And where are the preachers? Where are the prophets? Don't tell me Juanita Bynum or whatever her name is, is a prophet. Yeah, I named her. Some of you people who watch this program, you watch our, our service. Some of you people are as foolish as anybody because you still, 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 still are hooked on this false mindset of celebrity preachers. You still buy into the notion that those who've attained great notoriety and great celebrity. Oh, they've done so because of the blessing of God. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't give me, I don't care, Miss Bynum, I don't care how much you call yourself a prophetess. I know better. You know why I know better? Because a true prophet of God would be sounding a warning right. and saying, the church is not acting right. We're not doing right. We're not living right. We're not living peaceable lives. We're not living joyful lives. We're not living lives that seek to bring together to reconcile. The Bible said that God hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. That means to bring together. Tommy had come to me the other day. He had had an experience with a family member I'm trying to keep this generic movie. And this family member made a comment to him at, at a certain occasion or event. And immediately, of course, when you hear this comment, your mind immediately goes to why this person in particular is saying this particular thing. And it's not very positive. You know, immediately uh, knowing this person and knowing some of the stuff they believe and some of the things they're involved in, you immediately, you know, draw a negative inference from this particular statement. Well, how did I respond to Tommy telling me this? Did I say, well, you know them people. That's how they are. They love to sit in judgment of everybody else. They love to condemn everybody else. They love to... Did I jump on the angst train? Did I start stirring up the manure so I could make it smell worse than it smelled to start with? No, because that's not how a Christian acts. Did I, Booby? No. Nope. Immediately, I began to offer him alternatives. I said, well, considering this and considering that, is it possible that he might have meant this or he might have meant that? You see, I'm trying to defuse the bomb. I'm not trying to add to it. But if you notice, people in the world... Somebody comes griping about something or somebody comes complaining about something or somebody comes distressed about something and people in the world immediately there's this tendency to to want to get on the boat and, and just really stir it up. You know what I'm saying? And if you know, that's how ungodly people behave. That's how wicked people behave. That's how people that don't know Jesus behave. But God's people are called, listen, to follow peace mm -hmm. with all men. Mm -hmm. And holiness, what does holiness mean? Holiness means to behave in a manner that is de demonstrative of your dedication and relationship to God. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man, no man, shall see the Lord. That doesn't mean, holiness preacher, that if your hair ain't a certain length and your dresses aren't a certain length and your sleeves aren't a certain length, that you're going to hell because you're not holy. Honey, he also said, follow peace with all men 
and holiness. So there are two things required if you plan on one day make in heaven. And that is you must first follow peace with all men and secondly you've got to strive after holiness. We've got Christians so called in the world today Tommy who don't even try nope. to strive for peace. Mm -mm. We had to go buy Tommy a suit for his grandma's funeral. He wanted to get a black suit for his grandma's funeral. We went to a couple of different suit stores. Finally went into one. He found one that worked for him, you know. And while he was in getting it fitted up so they could do whatever alterations they had to do, the salesman starts talking to me. First words off his lips. These should have been words, folks, that I welcomed. These should have been words that I was happy to hear. First words off his lips to me were, Are you a Bible believer? Immediately, every hair on the back of my head stood up. And I thought to myself, Okay, here comes the tomfoolery. Here comes the stupidity. Here comes the division. Here comes the angst. Here comes the negativity. How do I know this? Well, because this guy is asking me out of the blue if I'm a Bible believer. And it is sad that that would be the first thing I would think when somebody... Do you follow sure what I'm telling you? Sure is. First thought went to my head. Okay, here comes the crapola. Here it comes. Get ready. Get your shovel ready. And I said, I most certainly am. I didn't tell him I was a preacher. I said, I most certainly am. And he came out with, boy, I'm telling you, he said, like the Bible said, we're in that age when men are calling good evil and evil good. <sighs> no, your screen didn't freeze up. The preacher's kind of... I just stood there for a second. See, the words he's saying I agree with. But I know where he's coming from. I know what he's trying to say. Folks, i got news for you. Cults have utilized the tactic for decades and for centuries of using language that believers are already familiar with in order to make themselves sound like their mainstream or sound like their doctrine is uh, orthodox or their doctrine is sound, you know. But if you don't realize people can use words and use phrases and say things and they mean something so different from what you mean that it's not even funny. Y'all are literally talking opposite extremes. When a Mormon says, Heavenly Father, they mean their God, who is only one of many gods in the celestial, who was once a man as you and I are, but who has since found his way to Godhood, who then in turn had sex in heaven. Listen, you think I'm telling a fit? I ain't telling a fit. This is Mormon doctrine. Had sex in heaven with his celestial wives. They create little spirit babies. The little spirit babies wait for a, a child to be born on the earth. And then the little spirit baby comes down and gets in a body. That is Mormon doctrine, folks. When I say God my Father or God the Father, I'm not talking about anybody who was once a man. I'm not talking about somebody who went from manhood to godhood. I'm not talking about somebody who's up in heaven screwing around with a bunch of angelic wives. Hello now. But you see, they use language. And the language is similar, but the meaning is entirely different. The minute this man come out with this garbage about... The evil being good and good evil. I stood there for a second, but I want to tell you, if you think this preacher's iron don't get stirred up, and I don't want to start a war every once in a while, believe me, I do. But I also know what God expects of me, and I know I try hard to, to do it. 
Finally, after a minute, I said to him, I said, man, you're not kidding. I said, when you can call a philandering, cussing, divisive, racist, misogynist, narcissist like Donald Trump, when you can call him godly and tell me that he is a Christian, I said, then honey, you are calling good evil and evil good. And boy, he stood there like I hit him in the head with a stop sign. And then he said, well, I have to respectfully disagree. Well, at that point, I knew that my best recourse was to get out of there. Seriously, I'm not joking. I just turned around and walked away. Because I, I don't want to get into any further discussion with this man because I'm not going to act like a Christian all the heck if I keep talking to him. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But you see, there is a right way and there is a wrong way. The Bible said there is a way, listen to me children, there is a way that seemeth right unto men but the end thereof is destruction. Mm -hmm. We've got too many Christians today walking in carnality, walking in the flesh, walking according to the imaginations of their own mind, and they are not even trying to do things God's way. Well, let me tell you what the opposite of God's way. God's way is called godliness. If you're walking contrary to God's way, let me tell you what that's called. That is referred to in Scripture as wickedness. Wickedness does not mean that you are worshiping the devil and eating children under a... a, a pizza restaurant somewhere. That's not what wickedness means. Wickedness means the Bible said the whole world lieth in wickedness. Am I telling the truth? Wickedness means walking in a way that is contrary to God's way. It's that simple. In our primary text today, God tells Solomon after the temple has been erected and the Lord appears to Solomon at night and says, Solomon, I'm, I've heard your prayer and I am honoring you in that I'm accepting this place you have built as a house for me. He said, I'm accepting it. I'm, I'm going to accept it as a house for me, as a dwelling place for my spirit in the Holy of Holies. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But then he goes on to tell Solomon, he said, listen, if trouble comes, if things come your way that are contrary and that are troublesome, he said, listen, there is a prescription. There is something that the people of God can do. And he gave us that prescription. He said, if my people who are called by my name Got a prophetic word for you today, children. If my people who are called by my name, God is saying, listen, would humble themselves. Humility requires that you acknowledge, listen to me now, that you don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And half of what you think you know, you don't know. Mm -hmm. The opposite of humility is pride. Pride cometh before destruction. America is headed for utter destruction because people who are called by the name of the Lord are so full of pride, they think they know everything. They think they know stuff they don't know because they're believing a bunch of idiotic conspiracies. That's not how God's people act. God's people don't buy into conspiracies. The Word of God tells us, love your enemies. Love your enemy. Didn't Jesus say, love your enemies? Yes, He did. Well, I've got news for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we have a breakdown of the nature of love. One of the aspects of love, listen to me now, is believeth no evil. That's why when somebody comes to me and they got nothing but negative nasty accusations to make about somebody 
I don't just buy it because they say it to me. I got people today in the affirming Pentecostal movement who won't have anything to do with me because there are false brethren out there who for decades have been trying to destroy my reputation and destroy my integrity and make me look... Here's the funny thing. Here, here's the, here's the, this is the thing that kills me. They don't accuse me of stuff. They accuse me, listen of doing the same things they do. Well, what does that tell you about them? Mm -hmm. Well, you're standing there jumping on their bandwagon. Well, I'm going to hate Brother Charles too because RPI hates Brother Charles, so I'm going to hate Brother Charles. I'm not going to. I'm going to pick his preaching apart. I'm going to find fault with every word that comes off his lips. I'm going to ignore everything else. You're foolish. Honey, when you get to heaven, I know for a fact that God's behind what I'm preaching. <laughs> I know for a fact the Lord's going to look at you and say, why didn't you listen to him? It don't bother me you want to act the fool. I'm not the one alienating you. You're the one alienating me. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. But you know what? People come to me and they have something negative to say about this one or that one. I'm inclined sometimes to believe it because I've heard it from numerous witnesses. Not one, not two, dozens. And I'm talking people who have experienced it firsthand, not people who heard it, you know. I'm not, I'm not listening to gossip, but people who have experienced it firsthand, and they're telling me, this person tried to sleep with me, this preacher tried to get in bed with me, this preacher invited me to come have a three-way with he and his partner, you know. Things that I've condemned, and for that reason, these preachers are running around literally saying, here's the funny part, he does the same things we do. Got news for you, my buddy. You are wrong as rain. You couldn't be more wrong. This preacher don't play those games. I know better. I know I'm going to stand before God in the judgment. I know that as a man of God, called of God, anointed of the Holy Ghost, that I'm going to be held to a higher standard. And you think I'm stupid enough to put my soul in peril by acting the fool like y'all do? No, I do not. And I got news for you. I also am not stupid enough to preach against anything I'm doing. There have been times in my life when I was struggling, especially after coming back to church, after being out of church for a couple of years. I was struggling to get certain aspects of my behavior back in line, you know, because once you let the cat out of the bag, it's not always easy to get them back in. I went through some years where I really struggled with certain aspects of things. And you know what I never did during that time? You never once heard me preach about those things. Mm -mm. And I'm serious. I'm not stupid, Tommy. I'm not stupid. I'm not going to preach something and then turn around and have somebody find out I'm doing it. You know what I'm saying? Don't you remember what brought down Jimmy Swagger? Jimmy Swagger was the only preacher I knew years ago when I was pastor in my first church. Every message he preached, he talked about prostitutes. Every message he preached, Jimmy Swagger, go back and look on YouTube at his old messages. Every message he preached, he talked about prostitutes. I didn't think anything of it. Never, you know, never crossed. I just thought, well, he has a certain burden for prostitutes, or you know. Well, lo and behold, when trouble came his way and he was exposed for behaving in ways he ought not to have been behaving, what did it involve? Prostitutes. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So I'm not stupid enough to preach on something that I'm doing. Do you follow me? No, I'm going to cover that territory, but I'm going to get myself right first. The only difference between me and some of them other characters is 
they have justified themselves in their conduct, whereas I was struggling against it, trying to get it back in line. You follow what I'm telling you? And did I? Yes, I did. Hallelujah. I promise you I did. It took some work. It took some time. It took some effort. But I got it. And I wouldn't be preaching what I'm preaching now if I wasn't living what I'm living now. God gave us a prescription for revival. He gave us a prescription for healing. If my people, which are called by my name, honey, let me tell you something. God is not looking for, quote, Americans to act right. God is not looking for American law to look right. God is not looking for abortion law to be changed. God is not looking for this or that or gay marriage to change. Those are not things God's looking at. If you notice when he spoke to, uh, to Solomon, he said, If my people, the only people on this planet that God gives a care in the world, I used to know people that loved correcting other people's kids. They loved chastising and rebuking and sometimes even, uh, you know, hitting on other people's kids, especially when I was little. I had a great aunt who was famous for being the disciplinarian boy. She'd come up from Texas to Connecticut every summer, and boy, when she came up, all of a sudden, everybody was scared to death because old Aunt Dorothy was a disciplinarian. She'll call you out in a minute. She'll yell at you. She'll let you know, boy, in a minute. She'll threaten you up one side down the other. You know what I'm saying? What she needed to do was mind her own business and mind her own household, take care of her own kids, and let everybody else take care of their own. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? God ain't looking for the unrighteous. God is not looking for the ungodly. God is not looking for the wicked to act right, folks. And if you're stupid enough to be led astray by preachers who have convinced you that that is the mission of the church, then you need to have your head examined. The prescription for revival is, if my people, I don't care what the world's doing. I don't care what secular society is doing. I don't care what the government is doing. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray And seek my face. See, a lot of people think praying is seeking God's face. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. Seeking the face of the Lord is one thing. Praying is something else. Praying, you talk to Him. Oh my God, listen to me, children. Seeking His face is when you're asking God if you can speak with Him. Not to Him. With Him. The Lord appeared, listen to me, He appeared to Solomon in the night. Solomon saw the Lord. God made a physical apparition that He uh, appeared to Solomon with. This is called, in theological terms, they refer to it as a theophany. I guarantee you, Oh, glory. The same man that Nebuchadnezzar saw in the burning fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the same man that Solomon saw this night speaking to him after the temple was finished. 
And it's the same man who walked the streets of Galilee. It's the same man who placed his arms to either side so they could be nailed to a cross. It's the same man who declared it is finished and gave up the ghost saying, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is the same man who was buried in a borrowed tomb and three days later rose again. And according to the apostle Paul appeared unto as many as 500 people at one given time. There were far more witnesses to the Lord's resurrection than just the twelve apostles. Seek His face. Lord, I, I want to draw so close to You that You and I can speak in person. I want to see you face to face. I want to have, you ever heard somebody say, I want to have a face to face with so and so. I don't want to talk to him on the phone. I don't want to talk to him on the CD. I don't want to talk to him on the radio. I don't want to talk to him through this medium or that medium. I want to face to face with them. Do you hear what I'm telling you? When you say to seek the Lord's face, that literally is what you're saying. I want to have a face to face. I'm going to tell you there's a little problem with the face-to-face. -face. You remember the Old Testament prophet in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon His throne. He was high and lifted up and His train filled the temple. Remember the old prophet as he stood before the Lord and he, he suddenly became aware of his faults. He became aware of his weaknesses. He became aware of his sins. He said, oh Lord, he said, oh God, no, I'm a sinful man. I dwell amongst the sinful people. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I'm going to tell you something that a face-to-face -face with God will do. A face-to-face -face with the Lord will make you more aware of your failings and your your fault, not because God condemns you, not because God criticizes you, but honey, if you've ever stood in the presence of somebody who was so beautiful and so handsome and so pretty that they just blew your mind and all of a sudden you were aware of every pimple, every zit, every mole, every, you know, ounce of body fat you have. Why? Because suddenly in their presence, by comparison, you become intensely aware of the reality of you. Do you hear what I'm telling you? See, that's what the church in America today is not doing. They may pray, but they're not seeking God's face. They don't want to get in the Lord's presence and have to look at Him one-on-one -on -one because if they do, all of a sudden they're going to realize, I am acting so far from Jesus. I'm not even beginning to act like Jesus. Jesus wouldn't be going to these rallies and screaming and hollering. Jesus wouldn't be threatening violence to overthrow a government. Jesus wouldn't be fear, afraid that the sins of those people over there were going to bring condemnation and destruction on His head. Am I telling the truth? Mm-hmm. Seek my face, listen, and turn from their wicked ways. This doesn't mean that the people of God are, you know, sleeping around and slutting around and drinking themselves drunk and engaging in orgies and doing all this. No, no, no. Those things would be qualified, listen to me now, those things are qual qualify as evil. See, there's a difference between evil and wicked. Wicked is a broader blanket. It simply means those who do contrary to the will and way of God. Period. All the world lieth in wickedness. That's what the Word of God tells us. But not everybody is evil. Am I telling the truth? There are some people who are so sold out to the devil. They're so sold out to sin. They're so sold out to debauchery. They're so sold out to uh, things that God despises and hates. Sowing division, lying. I could name one man in particular. And I guarantee you that in the eyes of God, that man is evil. Period. Case closed. End of the story. The orange Cheeto is evil, folks. And you'd have to be a Christian without a lick, without an ounce of 
ability to discern anything, to think anything different. The man doesn't even hide it. He lies and lies. He says things in an effort to stir up division. He tries to push people toward violence. That is not a godly person. That's not somebody who's trying to follow after God's ways and do things the way that God would have them to do. But not only are they not trying to do things God's way, but they are purposely doing things the exact opposite way. And they are doing it with fervor and with passion. That is evil. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? But the Lord said if they turn from their wicked ways, meaning what? Get back on track. Get back to doing things the way that I desire they be done. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Now? Oh, there's a prescription for America. There's a prescription for the church. There's a prescription for revival. If my people, which are called by my name, shall first humble themselves, secondly pray, thirdly seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Get back on track. Get back to doing things the way I would have them done. He said, then... Then, and only then, will I hear from heaven, meaning from my abode in heaven, I'll hear them, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. He says, I'll forgive them, not only will I forgive them, but I'll heal Everything they've destroyed, I'll heal. I'm going to tell you, if God's church gets back on track, if we experience revival and God's people start acting like God's people are supposed to act and doing like God's people are supposed to do and living like God's people are supposed to live and the church gets back to its vision, gets back to its first love, gets back to the place where God wants them to be and does things the way God wants them to do it, guess what's going to happen? It is going to impact not only the church but the world around us because when the church is right when the church does right they don't have to pick it to change laws they don't have to pick it to change behavior their rightness literally rubs off on the environment when the church is doing like the church ought to be doing it literally rubs off on the community around them the word of god said in the book of acts that the, the apostles came into a city and they were preaching and performing miracles. And the Word of God said, And there was great joy in that city. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even the unbelievers benefit when God's people act right and do right. Revival in the church today is the only hope for our nation and for our world. For too long, too many lies have been told and repeated which have caused a number of egregious errors within the Christian church. It's time to humble ourselves before the Lord and acknowledge that we have not in fact gotten many things right. Had we gotten things right, the conditions in our nation would be very different. But when the church is responsible for spreading hate, malice, stirring up angst, encouraging violence, something is grossly wrong. Revival stirs within us a recognition of the need to do right. To act right. To live right. With revival comes not only the knowledge of right. Listen to me. But the burning desire to do right. Mm -hmm. American exceptionalism. Listen to me. Oh, I'm telling you, a lot of people are going to gag on these words. But I declare to you right now in Jesus' name, thus saith the Lord. American exceptionalism and manifest destiny are false doctrines which Satan has used to inspire the American church 
to act in all kinds of wicked ways. There is only one nation on the face of planet earth that is unique among the nations. Having a special, unique, sacred relationship with the God of all creation. And that nation is not the USA. Trying to read and apply scripture passages which specifically apply to Israel as though they somehow shared significance with the United States is biblical malpractice. 2 Samuel 7.23 And what one nation on the earth is like your people Israel? whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make a name for himself and to do a great thing for you and awesome things for your land before your people whom you have redeemed for yourself from Egypt, from nations and their gods. The question is asked, and what one nation on the earth is like your people Israel. There is no other nation that even begins to come close to having the kind of relationship that God has with Israel. God's relationship with Israel goes all the way back to His promise to Abraham. It is a covenant relationship. It is a relationship that God designed for one very specific purpose. And there is no other nation on the planet that has anything even similar. So trying to make you, the United States of America using the concept of American exceptionalism, using the concept of manifest destiny in order to make America some great, you know, God requires more of us. God requires us. You're full of garbage. And Satan has used that distraction since the beginning of this country to drive the people of God to behave in wicked ways. Revelation 2, 1 through 7, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. There's a difference between wicked and evil. You can fall under the category of wicked and be a perfectly lovely neighbor, a nice person, you know, all that. But you still fall under the blanket of wickedness. But evil are those who purposely, passionately act against God and against God's ways. He said, and cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Boy, i got news for you, children. That is not the majority of Christians today. Every dingbat gets on TV and calls himself an apostle. People run around and they call them apostles. I'm going to tell you a little secret. And, and you think I'm kidding if you want to. I've preached in churches with pastors who called themselves apostles, and I refuse to use that title. Just because you call yourself an apostle doesn't make you an apostle, and I'm not about to call you one. I don't know you, I don't know your ministry, I don't know nothing about you, and as far as I'm concerned, there were 12 apostles, and you ain't one of them. But we got people, when I was ordained, the pastor who ordained me, mainstream, apostolic pastor, he stood over me and prayed over me and he said, you know, brother, you have the ministry of an apostle. And when he said those words, I shook my head, no. No, I do not. 
I may have a ministry of leadership. I may have a ministry of church planting. I may have a ministry that in many ways resembles the ministry of the apostles, but I am not an apostle. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And I'd be beyond stupid, and I'd be full of pride, and I'd be foolish to accept that spoken of me when I know it is not so. Said so you've tried them which say they are apostles and have found them liars. Oh, we got people running around. They think because Kenneth Copeland's on TV, they think because Rod Parsley's on TV, they think because uh, Billy Graham or Franklin Graham is on TV that they are in effect apostles. Honey, those very people that you believe today to be apostles are liars. They speak fibs. They speak false doctrine. They speak false teaching. They inspire God's people to act in ways that are contrary to the way of God. I'm telling the truth today. He said, and has borne and has patience. And for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, oh my goodness, this, this church is some of the best people there are. This is some of the best saints that ever lived. They, they're doing all the right things. The Lord said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. <sighs> Children, I want to tell you today, even the best of the best, even the cream of God's crop, can lose their first love. They can become distracted. I'm trying to bring this to a close today. You know, I've, I've read a number of books over the years and studied uh, marriage counseling and relationship counseling. And I've spoken to a number of people. I spoke to a couple one time that had gone to PTL, Jim and Tammy Baker's ministry down there in uh, North Carolina. And they were on the verge of divorce. Their marriage had really sunk to a bad place and they were not getting along and, and they, they were in a very bad place. And they told me themselves this story. And they said one day the wife was watching PTL and Jim and Tammy were talking about this marriage counseling program that they had down there at Heritage USA. And if your marriage was in trouble and you were Christians and you were trying to preserve your marriage, you didn't want a divorce, you know, to come and let this program help you, you know. Well, this wife called her husband over. And she said, honest to God, she said, we could barely talk to each other at this point. She said, we were living in the same house and we hated each other's guts. She said, I called my husband over and I, I showed it to him and he listened for a minute. And she said, what do you think? She said, if we do this and it don't work, well then we'll just get a divorce because we can't keep living the way we're living. And he said, okay, let's try it. We're Christians, we're believers. He said, you know, we ought to be able to at least tell the Lord, Lord, we tried everything we knew to do and, we, and if we still can't do it, you know, we'll divorce. They said, we went to that program, Charles. They said, and in that program, we realized, we were, we were taught, we were led to understand that in a lot of marriages, and a lot of relationships, people become angry with one another, they become disenchanted with one another, they become disillusioned and disenfranchised from one another because of all kinds of external things that are putting pressure on them. All kinds of external things that are stressing them out and all. And she said, and when you finally stop for a minute and look at your life and look what's going on and look at the circumstances, you're able to identify, okay, 
this issue here is stressing me out. This issue here is stressing My job is driving me crazy. You know, my car is always busted. And I, our, our finances are in a mess. You know, blah, blah, blah. All these things. Our sex life isn't what it ought to be. You know, whatever. And all of a sudden, she said, you realized. She said, we realized. We never loved each other any less than we did the day we met. Said, I still admired everything about him <laughs> that I admired the day I met him. I still loved everything about him that I loved the day I met him. She said, but I couldn't see those things that I used to see because I used to focus when we first met and we first got together. That's all I looked at. She said, but when the kids started growing up and trouble started coming and issues started rising, when we started having money trouble, when we started having car trouble, when we started having house issues, when we started having work uh, stresses, she said, all of a sudden, all that outside stuff crowded out in effect their first love. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And that's what the Lord is telling us today, children. We need revival in the church. We need it bad. We need it now. I'm the only preacher, honestly, I'm going to say this, and, and if you want to find fault with it, have a party. I could care less. I'm the only preacher I know who's getting up in America today. Now, there may be thousands. I don't know. But I'm the only one I know of who's getting up today and preaching this message. I'm the only preacher that I know who's getting up today and using my pulpit and my voice and my ministry and my exposure on the internet to try to get this message across to God's people. We need revival. We must be restored to our first love. We have to repent, which means turn around. It means you're going the wrong direction. The church is not acting as the church ought to act. The church is acting like the world. It's angry. It's full of angst. It's full of division. It's stirring up strife and negativity. That is not what God's people are called to behave like. We have got to climb the mountain, folks, and once again become the light of the world, a city that is built on a hill which cannot be hid. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Oh, I'm going to tell you. Hmm. <laughs> Tell you folks, some people, you know, you may not believe what this old preacher say, Pastor, you ain't got a soul in the world give a fire about what you have to say. You don't have a church full of people in Dallas come to listen to you. That's right, I don't. When the Lord called me to preach, he said, You're gonna be like John the Baptist. And you know where John preached? In the wilderness. Well, honey, Dallas, Texas couldn't be any more wilderness than where John preached. Say, oh, there's a lot of people in Dallas. Yeah, there's a lot of people here, but there's people who love appearances. There are people here who, as long as you've got a great cathedral and a fancy building and beautiful structures, they're willing to come. But if you ain't got all that, they could care less because your message means nothing to them. John had people who were not drawn to a man who dressed pretty, who weren't drawn to a man who had all kinds of money, who didn't think that because the preacher was rich and wore $500 suits, that all of a sudden what he had to say was probably better than what that little preacher in Dallas has to say am I telling the truth I'm here to tell you today folks you can take it you can leave it it's the truth our only hope for America today is for God's people to experience revival because if God's people will experience revival, our nation and our land will be healed. Hallelujah. That is our only hope. Would you stand with me this afternoon?